Amen. Well, thank you for that beautiful music. Wasn't that great music tonight, First Baptist Church? That was good and great music. Don't we like good music at First Baptist Church? That's right. If you don't know what good music is, you heard some tonight. If you're still wondering, I did that series on music. Go back and listen to it. And uh, you shouldn't be listening to bad music. You should listen to good music. Amen? Good. Have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And if you need a handout, I believe we still have some as we finish up this series, or this part of the series, Which Church and Why. They're coming back in now. So if you need a handout, put that hand up there. I think we have just uh, we have a few. So if you need a handout, raise them up there, and ushers will bring them to you. I got some up here. Excellent, right there. And 1 Timothy over there. They're coming over there. All right, excellent. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And we are looking forward. I'll keep those hands up. Thank you if you need one of those handouts. And if you'd like one down here, I think we have enough for you guys, too, if you want one. So, yep. So bring them down front, too, when you're done, Brother Joe. Thank you so much. There you go. Thanks, Brother Homer. Excellent. All right. Good to see you. All right. And we're getting ready for Easter around here at First Baptist Church. Of course, we, uh, the Lord has allowed us to uh, be on the television again this year for Easter. Yep, and here too, Brother Joe, I think they need some up here. And uh, we're recording songs left and right and getting those things all tuned up and edited all, all those things. You'll be in prayer for Easter at First Baptist Church, and we will have a service live here at 11 o'clock a.m. on Easter morning. Now, on Easter morning, we will not have Sunday school at 10 o'clock, but I will ask you to join me online, and I have something prepared and I would ask that you with your family in your house join me and my family as we are in our house doing something live uh, right around that 9.15 mark on Easter morning to prepare our hearts for Easter Sunday. And then after that, it'll be about 15 or so minutes. We'll spend some time in prayer, and I'll be leading this live. And if you with your family in your, in your place, in your house, then we'll come here at 11 o'clock a.m. for our Easter resurrection service. I'm looking forward to that service and the uh, good, good music that, that's happening. The choir is doing a phenomenal job. The groups are doing a great job. And then from there, we'll be dismissed in Easter evening, Resurrection evening. We're going to celebrate communion here at First Baptist Church. We'll have the Lord's Supper. And uh, that night, if you're online, we'll not be broadcast live. That is for our church family and those who have joined us in person that night. There will be a broadcast that night. There will be a sermon played, and you can uh, hear it that way. But that service, uh, Easter evening, Resurrection Sunday, for our church family will be right here, and it will not go out anywhere else. So just, just special things just for us that night. And so that's our kind of our schedule for Easter. Looking forward to God using that in a special way. I love Easter or Resurrection Sunday. Probably the most significant, most significant Christian holiday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul said this, if the resurrection didn't happen, if Jesus didn't really raise from the dead, we are of all men, he said, most miserable. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave and rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain. God is a liar, and we are wasting our time. If we're just wasting our time, we ought to go home. But we're not wasting our time our way. Jesus Christ is alive. And so I'm glad uh, for that for Easter Sunday. Have your Bibles open, hopefully, to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And looking at verse number 15 and 16. Kind of the foundation for this particular lesson, which church and why this church? Where the Bible says, Paul to Timothy, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The church is entrusted. Its business is being upheld and upholding the truth of Jesus Christ, defending against assaults from error and transmitting the truth to future generations in current times. We are, of all times, uh, need in this country, in this world, the truth of Jesus Christ. What will change someone's life is not just some self-help or some good ideas or some kindness. What will change someone's life is the truth, the foundational transforming truth of Jesus Christ. That we're all sinners, that God loved us, Jesus died for us, and that by believing in Him and trusting in Him, He'll save us. That is what will change people. That is what... We'll bring them from the walk of spiritual death to spiritual life. That will change their attitude if it's genuine faith. Like it ought to change our attitude if it's genuine faith. As a Christian, you ought to have a better attitude. Not just to be thought of a good attitude, but because Jesus Christ lives, is inside you. 
Uh, that means you're going to treat your spouse better, differently, because of Jesus Christ. You're going to treat your spouse better and differently. Wait, I'm waiting for my wife to say amen. Oh, there it is. Okay. There we go, right there. And, uh, and who else was on my list here? Okay, there we go. No, no. Uh, that means you'll, you'll be a good employee and a good employer. Why? Not so just people just think well of you, but because of Jesus Christ, that they may see your good works and think you're a great person. They'll see your good works and want to go to church with you. They'll see your good works and they'll compliment you. They'll give you awards. They'll elevate you to high positions. They'll, they'll recognize you in front of the whole world. No, so they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The thing that will change this is the truth of Jesus Christ, and it is the church's business, our obligation to communicate, uphold, and to be upheld by the truth. Well, Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight as we continue on this series. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'd give me the strength and wisdom that I need. Lord, as we go through these things, would you touch our hearts? Would you challenge us? And Lord, as a church, would you grow us and strengthen us? In Jesus' name, amen. Let me briefly go through these blanks real quick and get to the new material tonight, and we'll wrap up this particular handout tonight, the good Lord willing. There is, first of all, a call to the church. The call to the church. The church is called to be supported by the truth. We do not believe, like some religions, that the church manufactures the truth. We do not create the truth. The truth is found in Jesus Christ, and we're supported by the truth. We don't claim that you can only be saved if you're a member of the true church. All right? The church is supported by the truth, and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The church is called to be supported by the truth. But the second blank there, the church is called to speak the truth. You don't come to church just to hear a, a nice little um, play or something. We may have a play sometimes. You don't come to church just to hear some nice music, though we try to have nice and good music at First Baptist Church. We come because we're called to speak the truth. Sometimes that truth sounds like, boy, you know what? God loves you, and what you're going through, God can bring you through that trial, that test. Other times, the truth is, listen, you're a dirty, rotten scoundrel, so quit it and please God. The truth, all, and, and usually it's somewhere in between, Right? Usually in the, in the same, the message from God's word is, boy, I need that. Oh, I didn't like that. Oh, I need that. Oh, we're called to speak the truth. And number three, the church is called to strive for the truth. We ought to be passionate about the truth. Not jerks, not rude, but passionate for the truth and strive for the truth. There are, and there is some confusion in church. That next blank, confusion in church. Confusion in the types of churches. Boy, you, you go down, and I mentioned this, there are in America... 380,000 approximately registered religious congregations or about one church for every 1,000 people. That's a whole bunch of churches and they're not all the same. That sermon preached years ago, things that are different aren't the same. We are not all going to the same place and we do not all serve the same God. There's confusion. Number two, there's confusion in the teaching of churches. Confusion in the teaching of churches. We went through some of that on some of the local churches, the local churches that we run into around the area. Now, again, just to remind you, I do believe that you can be saved and be in part of a different church. You're saved not by what church you go to, but by leading Jesus Christ. So if you believe in Jesus Christ and death, burial, resurrection, Paul says that's the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, you can be saved no matter what the title of the church is. And it also doesn't matter what church you go to. You can go to a good church and not be saved. All right, you can say, well, I go to a great church, preach the gospel, and if you don't believe that, you're not saved no matter how many services you go to. There's confusion in the teaching, and there's confusion in the traditions of churches. Remember, there are issues and there are preferences. There are things that are a big deal, and there are things that aren't a big deal. How long? The whiskers on my face happen to get is not a big deal. That doesn't mean that you may not like it or like it either way. You say, Pastor, why do you have that, that beard or that facial hair? Because my wife likes it. And I married her, not you. Last time I checked. 
And uh, so if you don't like it, and I'm not trying to be mean, but it, that's not a big deal now, is it? I might wear a tie you like, I might wear a tie you don't like. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. Big deal? If I come up here and use a different Bible, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. The, the truth that we find in God, that's a, that's a big deal. And I read you that, that quote, let me read it again, that, that someone said it this way. Uh, let me find it here. Uh, they said that in this day and age, um, oh boy, I can't find it here. All right. Eh, it's in my notes somewhere. What they said was, uh, we have a president who is trying to bring about an LGBTQ agenda and bring things that don't please the Lord. And as Christians, we argue about facial hair, translations, worship style, and clothes. Let's remember who the true enemy is. He's not referring to the president, but to a wrestle against flesh and blood. The problem I have with that statement is that I agree there are, there's a greater enemy, and that is the devil. All right, he's a greater enemy, but other things are not the same. And uh, what Bible translation I use is not the same as how long my whiskers are. How we worship at church is a big deal to a holy God. All right, not, and to equate worship style with the clothes you wear, all right, not the same thing. You remember in your Bible, God killed two men for worshiping him incorrectly, Nadab and Abihu. They came to worship God in their own manner, their own way, and God said, no, you cannot worship me that way. I will not accept that worship. Cain came to worship God in his own way. God cares how we worship. There are things that are a big deal and things that are not a big deal, things that matter and things that don't matter. And then I, I, the next point there, the conviction of our church, there are five fundamentals of our faith. Five fundamentals of our faith. Now, just because we agree on these five fundamentals does not mean that we would even work together as churches. These five fundamentals would define, I would argue, Christianity. If you don't believe in these five fundamentals, then you're not even Christian. These five fundamentals are as follows. The deity of Jesus Christ. If you deny the deity of Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian. All right, we're not operating on the same wavelength. Jesus Christ is God. He is not a God. He is not one of the gods. He is God, the deity of Jesus Christ. He is not the brother of the devil. All right, he is the only begotten Son of God. You say, well, Pastor, I've heard that since I was three years old in church and learned John 3, 16. Yes, yes, but you will be tempted in this day and age to allow people to just influence you to be tolerant. Where, where they will influence you to say, well, you believe what you believe and I believe what I believe and it's all okay. And it's not okay. It's not okay. Jesus being God is not just, oh, you think what you think, I think what I think. All right, that is Chevy Ford. Not Jesus God, Jesus not God. Deity of Jesus Christ, number two, the virgin birth. Jesus was born, not as some versions say, of a young woman, though she was a young woman. The Bible says that Mary was a virgin, never known a man. We believe in the virgin birth. And as Isaiah 7, 14 says, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. And what kind of sign is it if a young lady has a baby? It happens every single day in America. But a sign from God is a virgin. Conceiving by the Holy Ghost, that's a sign from God. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth. Number three, we believe in the blood atonement. The death of Jesus Christ was not just a violent death. The death of Jesus Christ was his shedding of his blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, which is incorruptible. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, with whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. I believe the Bible teaches that the blood of Jesus Christ is incorruptible, will not corrupt, will not fade away. That Jesus still has the same blood. Someone asked once, well, what about his fingernails? Well, the Bible doesn't talk about his fingernails, does it? Right? So I'm not worried about that. It does talk about his blood. Yes? Yeah, we worry about the blood atonement. And number four, the bodily resurrection. That Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It wasn't just a trick by the soldiers, the disciples. 
or the religious leader, leaders that Jesus Christ, who was dead, is now not dead. He was in a tomb, now he's not. Now he ain't. He's in heaven, interceding for us. And number five, the inerrancy of Scripture. That all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. I want you tonight, with the Lord's help, hit that last section. But then why are we Baptists? Those five fundamentals, and there's a number of churches, and they would be referred to in a evan as evangelical. A number of people would, would hold to those five fundamentals, but they're not necessarily Baptist churches. So why are we Baptist? Why aren't we just a community church? Why aren't we the river, the rock, the wind that rustles through the trees on a balmy day, the peace gathering city? Why not? Now, I don't know why people change their names of their churches. I know what they say why they do that, but I, I don't really understand it. Right one time, someone told me that they changed their name because they felt that, that people wouldn't come if they had church in their name. Now, that boggles my mind because once you come to this place, no matter what I call it, once the preview video stops counting down, right, and I get up there, you're going to figure out real quick it's church. What? This isn't football? Oh, you, you snookered me. You got me. All right, so I don't know why, why having church or not, no one's going to come now. I know of one church who had the same name as a large concert venue, and people confused their church and the concert venue where there was just wicked, awful concerts going on, so they changed their name so people wouldn't confuse what, what they were referring to. That makes a lot of sense to me. But, but to, to not call ourselves First Baptist Church, now sometimes you'll see in our tracks or on our uh, media, it'll just say First Baptist and not church. And you say, aha, pastor, you're compromising. I knew it. I knew it. You're just waiting. You're just waiting for your second year here to compromise. No, that's not why. Sometimes we don't include church on the media, per my instruction, for, for two reasons, or, or one reason and one caveat in there. One is because First Baptist Church takes a whole lot of space. And number two, no one that I know confuses First Baptist with anything other than a church. There's not a First Baptist bar. There's not a First Baptist Walmart. If you hear First Baptist, by and large, saved or unsaved, in church your whole life or in church for the first time, you hear First Baptist, you're like, oh, that's a church. If there was a First Baptist bar, you know what our tracks would say? First Baptist church in big letters and confuse us. But why are we Baptists? Well, I want to go through what we, have, what we call the Baptist distinctives, and I have a, the, the, the word Baptist there spelled out. We're going to go through what makes us a Baptist church, and we've gotten these things from the Bible. There's a verse for each one. Again, you can go to heaven and not be part of the Baptist church. But I believe if you read your Bible and study your Bible that you will be a Baptist. I believe that is the right method, the right way. Not that we're right on everything in the whole world every single time. We're human, we're flesh, we're going to make plenty of mistakes. But we try to follow the Bible, which is number one, on the big letter B, the Bible. We are Baptists because number one, B, the Bible is the sole rule in matters of faith and practice. Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That is not just a nice reference for children. That is a great verse for every single one of us to live by. That I will have God's word be what guides me in life. So I read in the morning. Why? Because I need the direction. I need the direction from my heavenly father. I pick up God's word not just to check off a, check off a list, but to find out how I ought to live today, how I ought to react today, how, what I ought to spend my money on today. The Bible is supposed to be the sole rule, not only personally, but corporately as a church, the sole rule in matters of faith and practice. It should govern us, it should guide us, and it should undergird us. We must follow the Bible. Now there is, just past... The House of Representatives a little bit ago, an Equality Act. Now, I don't spend lots of time talking about politics here at church, but this Equality Act is worth mentioning because I would encourage you to reach out to your senator um, and voice opposition to it. 
this Equality Act threatens religious liberty. Threatens religious liberty. They're equating religious liberty or they're equating um, discrimination of race and ethnicity with sexual orientation and gender identity. What it would involve along the way, it would, implications, they're saying, implications would be that a school could not even have, um, or it would be tough for a school to have a specific code of contact in regards to sexual activity and orientation. In fact, one church faced this where they had a spaghetti dinner, um, and this was passed on a, not in a federal level, but this same type of act was passed in a municipality, and the church had a spaghetti dinner, and they were fined because the bathrooms were not open up to both male and females at the same time. All right, and so what it would involve is that you could go to any bathroom you wanted to just because you wanted to. And the issue is there is no, there is no religious exemption inside of this act. This is what we run by. And I hope this thing doesn't pass. But if it does, we still have expectation on our students. I also have expectation on the staff to live pure and holy lives, no matter what the federal government tells me to do. Why? Because this is supposed to be the sole rule in matters of faith and practice. It's reality that we will be challenged as we continue in this world till Jesus Christ comes back on issues about the Bible. And we love everybody. God so loved the world. We want people to come and hear the truth from God's Word, but we must be governed by the Bible and what God tells me and you to do. The Bible must be the rule for faith and practice and be the sole rule for that. It's a big deal when all of a sudden you have to bow to every whim and wind of doctrine, every idea. You can't keep up with it fast enough, can you? It changes. It changes. We will be challenged. There's no doubt about that in my mind. You know what we ought to do? Stand strong. Not being bad in our spirit, but strong in our spirit. And where does that strength come from? Not in resolve, but the Word of God. We stand this way. There is still a man, last I checked, at least I think it was today, uh, still in jail in Canada for having church. As I checked, he was still, still in jail and refuses to sign a statement from the Canadian government. Sole rule, faith and practice. That's why we're Baptists. This act, um, the Equality Act, is endorsed by a number of religious organizations who think it's tremendous and great. There's a, another large number who are against this. Um, including Catholics are against this and the, the bishops are against this thing but there's a number of religious organizations who are like this is what we need that no one should feel excluded everyone should feel accepted the problem is I agree with that Jesus said that him that come up to me I will in no wise cast out but acceptance does not change how I have to act on certain things I can love you I can treat you well but that doesn't mean that I would allow men in my ladies bathrooms God created gender identity. All right, in the book of Genesis. The Bible says he created male and female. In Genesis, in the garden, there were three things that God gave uh, to Adam and Eve. He gave them a relationship with God. He gave them a role, male and female. He gave them roles, and he gave them responsibilities. All right, this is from God. So I could stay there, but i got to continue. We can get done tonight, all right? If you have any questions, you come call me, you talk to me, and we can talk through that. Number two, or letter A, we believe in the autonomy of the local church. Autonomy is a big word, easy way to explain it. It is the right to self-govern, the right to self-govern. That means that our church makes our own decisions. There is no hierarchy. There is no higher authority besides Jesus Christ. There is not someone in another state uh, sitting in an office saying, listen, 
First Baptist Church, you must give your money here. You must do this. No, we as a congregation, uh, we self-govern, we rule ourselves. Ephesians 1.22, hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. As a church, we make our own decisions. In our church, we vote on things, uh, on, on some things. Other things are governed through our, uh, through our constitution. As a church, we're not, pro we're not part of a broader denomination. Now, there are some big denominations out there. We have a group of younger men who want to join some of these bigger denominations because they like the camaraderie. I guess man inherently is a tribal creature. I think I didn't quite get that gene sometimes. I'm happy, I'm happy for us to be all by ourselves here, all right? But I also don't think it's bad to work with other good churches. They're not our enemy. The devil's our enemy. And we're looking forward to our soul winning conference. We have other like minded churches who want to spread the gospel. Come here. And of course, Brother Tread will be preaching, and, and Brother David Wood will be preaching, and they'll be preaching that Sunday as well. It's going to be great. And I am praying that we fill and pack this thing out upstairs, downstairs, adding chairs in the back, on the stage, everywhere, I, I, you know, everywhere. We'll, we'll pack this thing out. And that means not just our church is coming, though our church needs to be there. You clear your schedule, April 9th, that Friday night, and you be here, 6 o'clock, you be here and be part, of that, be part of that service, and you get challenged, and you get help that night. But I'm hoping we have many other churches. And I've talked to some pastors already. They said, Pastor Howell, I'm coming over there that night and bringing some people over there. We can work together in those things. But I'm not calling them and saying, hey, how are you voting on this? How am I voting on this? Let's make a good decision together. No, we govern ourselves. The autonomy of the local church. Number three, we believe in the priesthood of the believer. Now what that means is you and I get to pray straight to God in the name of Jesus. We don't pray to Mary. We don't ask her for her help. I read today someone said, well, the reason I pray to Mary is because I'm asking Mary to go hand Jesus my prayer because she's closer to Jesus than I am right now. But this, this was, you know, I, I, I don't have to go ask Mary to hand Jesus my prayer because I'm allowed to boldly approach the throne of grace all by myself. I can approach it while I'm at church. I can approach it while I'm at home. I can approach it while I'm driving down the road. I can approach it when the teenagers get their license and pull into the property. Lord, help us. You teenagers come, Pastor Howell, I got my license. That's not good news in my life. It's bad news. All the time. You see Nehemiah, right? He's standing there, he's nervous, he prays. Just like that, we can boldly approach the throne of grace, and I don't have to pray to anyone else. Someone said this about asking the saints to pray for them. Well, it's like asking your friends to pray for you. No, nope, praying to the, to the saints who are dead is not like asking my friends to pray for me. The Bible commands me or commands people to pray, Christians to pray for Christians. Pray for one another, pray for each other. Bear ye one another's burdens. The Bible commands us to pray for each other. It never says, pray to a dead person who's in heaven. I get to pray to God. He's alive. i uh, continue on. Oh, boy. The T. I'm almost done here. The T. We have two offices at our church. Pastor Deacon. Now, we have assistant pastors. We find those in 1 Timothy chapter 3 are the, the qualifications for pastor and deacon. The assistant pastors help assist the vision that I have for the church. You voted on me. I bring those men in and, and exit at, at my discretion. Um, but we vote, church votes on me, and we vote on deacons. Vote on deacons. And so, I don't know why you're smiling, Pastor Ryan. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, let's continue. I want to hit uh, individual soul responsibility, letter I. I'm going because there's two that I really want, want to hit here for us. Um, individual soul responsibility. Romans 14, verse 12, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. One day, every single person will stand before Jesus Christ, stand before God. And you'll give an account. And I just want to take a moment here. I had a note here to talk to parents real quick. Um, parents, prepare your, your, your child to stand before God. You help them study for your spelling words. You go over their Bible verses with them. And you, you help them make sure they're well-equipped for soccer or basketball. You do those things. Don't miss the most needful thing and prepare them to stand before God one day. When they answer that question, how did you live with your life? In that day, there will be no excuses. Not like math class or Spanish class. Well, you know, Lord, you have to understand here. What was going on? 
No, there's no excuse that day. Make sure that we're preparing our, our young people to stand before God. Grandparents, make sure you prepare your grandchildren. Make sure, husbands, you help your wives as, as spouses. Help the other person. Prepare to stand before Jesus one day. One reason that we lovingly confront, right, Bible confrontation, is because that I want you and you want me to have a good accounting before Jesus Christ one day. That's the greatest exam we will ever face. Individual soul responsibility. Letter S, and this one, this one can get, can get kind of, it can go sideways on us. Separation. Maybe you've been around church long enough to hear this word separation. Well, I'm separating from that church. You should have heard their music. Oh, brother, it was just wild. Wild up there, that music. Tell you what, we got to separate from them. Got to separate from that youth group. Why, you should have seen those young people. I've never seen them dressed so poorly in my life. I'm going to separate from them. That's right. Boy, I got to separate from that guy. You should have seen what he preached, and he was wearing a pair of jeans to preach in. Oh, brother, we got to separate. Separation. We do believe in separation. We do. Passage there, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. Read it later on. We believe in personal separation on a personal level from the world, from sin. We also believe in ecclesiastical church separation. Let me give you five tests of separation, things that we should separate from. Ready? If you got notes, write these down quickly. We're almost done tonight. I want to get to these for you. We want to test the test, or we want to give the test of expediency. Is it a weight? Hebrews 12:1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us weigh aside every weight, and the sin which just so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. If there is something holding you back in your Christian walk, you need to lay it aside. That's called separation. I separate from it. For some people, that would be their cell phone. Now, come on now. You know what I do. Cell phone can be an addiction. You say, well, now you're meddling, Pastor. You better believe it. If that's hindering your walk with God, you set it aside. That's separation. You set it aside. The weight which does so. I'm not saying it's sinful. I'm not saying the cell phone's sinful. It can be for sure. What I'm saying is sometimes there are things that are a weight. For some, it's probably football. Sports. You've got to set it aside. I'm not saying sports are bad or football is bad. I'm not preaching against football or sports. I'm just saying those things can be a weight. They can be a weight. We ought to separate from weights. Is it expedient? Does this help me run my race for Jesus Christ? If it doesn't, it's got to go. We believe in personal separation. Number two, the test of enslavement. Is it a habit? All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I've told you about one thing that I do in my life. There are certain days that I don't drink coffee. I don't drink coffee for this reason right here. I want to make sure on those days that I'm not enslaved to coffee. I love coffee. I enjoy coffee. In fact, if you get one of these mugs, remember, these are for coffee. Not for tea, not for milk, not even for water. They're for coffee. Why? How do you know that? Because I made sure we bought coffee mugs. <laughs> not milk mugs, all right? We bought coffee mugs. I love coffee. I enjoy it. But there are some days I don't drink it. I don't touch it. And I want to find out if I get a headache. I have never gotten a headache from not drinking coffee. If I did, I'll tell you right now, I, I will stop drinking it. I don't want to be enslaved to it as a habit for me. And, and, and coffee is a simple thing. I'm not saying it's sinful, but I don't want to be enslaved to, to, to coffee. If you can't put down the news in the morning, it's a habit. It's enslaved to it. For some people in the past, it's been talk radio. Some people, it's politics. Some people, it's connecting with their friends. None of those things, and I'm saying, are bad, but if they're controlling me, if they're controlling you, I must separate from it. Expediency, enslavement. Number three, the test of example. The test of example. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. 
Now let me be, let me kind of paint this one. This is not the end all test. It is impossible to live in a way that someone, somewhere, somehow, will not like something you do at some point. There's somebody who doesn't like, who doesn't like something that you do in your life. Well, do you instantly change? Not necessarily. But I'm not trying to create problems for other people. I don't want to create problems. When my kids started playing some travel sports, we prayed through that. Lord, is this something that we ought to do? Will this cause people to stumble at church? Not that you care what we do or not, but I don't want to be a problem. We have a problem at church, and we want to make sure that we're a good example. All right, it's not the only test in life, but it's it's one of the tests. All right, if so, I, we got to separate from those things. Number four, the test of evangelism. Does this help me win the unsaved to Jesus Christ? Does this help me win the unsaved to Jesus Christ? And number five, the test of exaltation. Does it glorify? Whether before you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. You see, normally when we talk about separation, we're talking about something someone else hasn't done that we think we're better in the area. We're more strict than them. We're more spiritual than them. That's often how we use that word separation. What I challenge us in the separation is to make sure that what we do pleases Him. Please, that's the most important goal in this. Along the way, could there be a place where we wouldn't coordinate with another church? You, absolutely. Absolutely. I have some good friends who believe they ought, or, or friends who, ought, who believe they ought to use a different version of the Bible. They're still my friend. Will they come and preach here? They won't. They won't. I guess if you, if you held me to it, you'd say, well, you're probably separating. Maybe. Maybe. They're still my friends, though. But I need, ought to be much more concerned about my life than what everyone else is doing. And lastly, we believe in that T. We believe in two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. We believe in baptism by immersion. The Bible teaches that. That word baptizo, I told you, was pulled over from the original Greek language. There was no word baptism in the, or baptism in the English language. They brought that over. Baptizo in secular, or, or that secular Greek, uh, also meant or used in relationship to cucumbers being dunked in pickles. You don't make pickles like this. Right? That's why we baptize like this. It's also a picture of the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ identifying with him that's why we baptize by immersion we believe that's an ordinance of local church and the Lord's Supper we'll celebrate that Easter night there is no timetable on how often or when to celebrate communion Lord's Supper Paul just says for as often as you do this or when you do this we believe those are for the church and that's why for our communion we ask that only those who are members of the church partake in that manner with us in communion uh, with the Lord's Supper. That's why we're Baptists from the Bible. And uh, I believe after studying God's Word, it's what we're supposed to be. It's the right way. It's a good way. If someone's not a Baptist, they're still my friend. If they're not saved, they can still be my friend. The truth of Jesus Christ. But as a church, we want to support and give the truth to everyone we know. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for uh, the truth from your word, Lord, help us. And Lord, help us to focus on us, Lord, and give the truth to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.